Hello, my name is Rick Pearson. Welcome to Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, we've learned in past weeks that in the latter days, certain sins would tempt believers, causing them to fall away from the faith. However, the greatest cause of the falling away would deal with a controversial topic already within the church today, and that topic is money. You don't want to miss this teaching. We'll be right back. Welcome to Prophecy USA. You know, the root word of Babylon is Babel. And in Hebrew, that literally means confusion. Now, from previous programs, we've learned that there are seven types of end time believers that would be affected by that Babylonian confusion. These believers would have to overcome certain sins in order to be worthy and chosen and rewarded as the bride of Christ. Believers of Ephesus had lost their first love towards God. Meanwhile, the believers in Sardis were involved in good works, but they weren't doing God works. The third group that we talked about was the group from Smyrna. These believers were persecuted believers, but the Bible promised those who are persecuted to hold on because great rewards were coming their way. The believers of Pergamos were struggling with issues of sexual immorality. They were seduced to follow the herd of modern Babylonian culture instead of the word of biblical protocol. Meanwhile, Thyatira, like Pergamos, allowed a Jezebel church leadership to seduce them, not only into immorality, but into all forms of immorality, which we uh, qualified as Baal worship. But perhaps the most proverbial sin that all believers would be forced to deal with in the end times occurs in the church of Laodicea. Now these believers had an issue with something that everyone today deals with on a daily basis, money. Now money's not the problem within the context of the Laodicean believers, but rather how the believers prioritize their money. And you might think that your money does not matter to God, but scripture states much differently. Listen to this. In the earliest days of Bible times, man did not have the medium of exchange we refer to today called money. Instead, they had the barter system. They would trade with each other animals, crops, precious stones, or whatever they had of equal value within their substance. However, the handling of a person's substance or accumulated wealth was one way that God evaluated a person's character or spirit. It was through the person's material substance that God demanded worship. The ancient Jewish people were mandated to give 10% of their first fruits. This is why farmers were commissioned to leave a portion of food in the fields for the poor and widows. Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible states, Leviticus chapter 27 verses 30 through 33 establishes that all the seeds from the land and the fruits from the trees belong to God and a tenth of all herd and flock are holy to the Lord. The people were expected to tithe their grain, wine, oil, and firstlings from the herd and flock. The tithe also included a social component to care for the poor within society. And every third year, the tithe must be set aside for the Levite, the resident alien, the orphan, and the widow. Blessings from God are directly connected to this mandate. The worshiper is to make all offerings, including the tithe, with joy and happiness. In Genesis chapter 14, the first man ever called prophet, Abraham, defeated his enemies in battle and gave one-tenth of his spoils to Melchizedek, the high priest of the Most High God. Immediately after the act of worship, the Lord appeared to Abraham in a vision and told him, Fear not, Abraham, for I am your shield 
and your reward shall be very great. It was at that time that Abraham was promised a son who would be heir to the patriarchal Jewish race. Two generations later, Abraham's grandson Jacob chose to participate in his grandfather's covenant with God by declaring, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. However, the priority of receiving God's blessings was to establish oneself in a preferred position between God and man, so that God could use Abraham and his descendants to release his blessing to others. Blessing others is what God calls righteousness in Hebrew protocol. The Hebrew word for righteousness is tzedakah, which literally means acts of loving kindness. According to many rabbinical and Christian theologians, the giving of tithe or first fruits of one's wealth was to prevent the Jewish people from becoming greedy and materialistic and allowed them to flow in acts of loving kindness to those less fortunate. They were blessed so they could be a blessing to the world. However, the Church of Laodicea, it seems, has a problem when it comes to the handling of money. Welcome back. You know, I find it fascinating to see that from the very beginning of man, even Adam had a mandate from God to work and produce substance for his existence. From that first commandment, God would transcend his acts of loving kindness to offer provision, guidance, and direction to whoever would call upon him. Now, we already learned in the previous programs that God would not only provide covenant with the nation of Israel, but to any nation or person who wanted to participate in that relationship. That covenant was based on man's free will to participate in it. Now, obviously, the seven churches that Jesus addressed in Revelation had become part of that covenant blessing with God. Five of those churches we've discussed had problems in that relationship due to participating in specific sins or what some might describe as missing the mark. However, the greatest area within the churches for missing the mark was found in this sixth group of believers that Jesus called the Church of Laodicea. And that missing ingredient was tied directly to money and how people were abusing its purpose. You know, Revelation says, I know thy works, for that thou art neither cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest I'm rich, I have prospered and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, to further explain this passage, in his ministry, Jesus told of a parable of a rich man. In Luke 12, he said, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones and store my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself for many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, thou fool, tonight thy soul is required of thee. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You know, being rich towards God is not an effort on God's part. It's an effort on our part by being generous with the blessings that he's already given us. And with regards to the church of Laodicea, it appears that Jesus is talking to believers who are healthy, happy, financially sound in their own minds, but they're like the rich young ruler. They're not rich towards God or generous towards God. They don't recognize God nor honor his blessings by using a portion of their first fruits to bless others less fortunate. Now, obviously, this group of believers believe in the covenant of salvation towards God, but they've not participated in the financial responsibilities, empowering the full benefits of that covenant. Now, in regard to the new believers, the New Testament believers' approach towards God and money, Scripture is very clear as to what our priorities should be. In 3 John 1, 2, it states that God wishes above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. 
Now this verse prioritizes that the most important asset you have is your soul, not your material assets. Remember in Deuteronomy 8, 18, it states that the Lord your God, it is He that gives you power to get wealth that He may establish His covenant through you. But what exactly is that covenant? Paul taught us in Romans 11 that through Christ, we are grafted into the Jewish family by having our hearts circumcised. He then further states in, in Galatians 3.14, so that the blessing of Abraham may come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now the first priority of that promise concerns your eternal souls in that Paul stated that salvation's of the Jews. And we who believe in Christ have actually become Jews, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter of the law. Although tithing in the Old Testament was the letter of the law, the New Testament now rests in the spirit of the law. In other words, it's a voluntary effort on every believer to participate in tithing. To not tithe means you do not participate in the full blessings, but to tithe will initiate a divine reciprocity between you and God. And reciprocity means giving and receiving. Now we've just scratched the service for what Jesus is saying to the modern day church of Laodicea. There's a tremendous blessing or a tremendous disappointment awaiting these end time believers. The difference clearly lies in the free will of those who will act upon Jesus' instructions. So stay tuned. You do not want to miss this next teaching. Four thousand years ago, an antichrist religion was birthed in ancient Babylon. Yet Joshua overcame it, Gideon overturned it, Elijah overwhelmed it, and Josiah overthrew it. This vile religion demands a rejection of God's commandments, a defiance of God's morals, a resurgence of Ashtoreth poles with rampant immorality, and the shedding of innocent blood that cries out for judgment. These are the signs of a nation seduced by Baal worship. But what is the answer? 2,000 years ago, innocent blood was shed for you. But will America come back? Will she seek God's forgiveness or will she suffer His judgment? Prophecy USA proudly presents a study guide addressing America's spiritual state of the union concerning her past, present, and future role in Bible prophecy. Call right now with your donation of $20 or more to receive your copy, 1-888-306-1759. Or go online to prophecyusa.org right now. Welcome back. We're looking at a group of end time believers Jesus called the Laodiceans. These believers have a serious problem concerning a lack of priorities between their money and their relationship with Christ. In fact, the problem is so severe that Jesus warns the Laodiceans that unless they redeem themselves, He will literally spew them out of His mouth at the time of the rapture. Now we've already learned that God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 said, I will bless you, Abraham, and I will make you a blessing. And that blessing was handed down to anyone who would participate in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, according to scripture, the richest and wisest descendant of Abraham was King Solomon, who reigned in approximately 1000 BC. However, King Solomon never had a gas furnace, air conditioning, never had electricity, he never had a microwave oven, electric stove, hot and cold running water. He never spoke on a cell phone, texted a friend, or surfed on the internet. That technology has all been invented within the last hundred years. Yet today, in North America, we have all these things, and most people complain that they don't have enough. And some even protest against the 1% who have even greater wealth than they do. In many regions of the world, people beg for food 
while we in North America pay other people to help us lose weight. What we call poor people in America live within the top 14% of the world's richest people. In other words, 86% of the world has less than 99% of us living in North America. Do you think it's possible that in the last days, the church of Laodicea could be found in the richest country in the history of the world? And we already know that the richest country in the history of the world is prophesied to be Babylon the Great. And Babylon the Great appears before the new world order comes into power. Is it possible that the falling away of the church Paul spoke about could have anything to do with how we use our money? Are the majority of Christians in North America rich within themselves, yet not rich or generous towards God? You know, according to a recent survey in Christianity Today, less than 20% of the Christian families tithe. Tithers underwrite almost 80% of the church's expenses and outreach ministries. Are 80% of the church members missing the mark when it comes to stewardship of their finances? Do they represent the modern day church of Laodicea? You know, 1 Corinthians 9.10 says, God places seed in the hand of the sower and he multiplies the seed sown and he increases the fruits of your righteousness or acts of loving kindness. Deuteronomy 18.8 says, God gives you power to get wealth but unless some of that wealth is sown or given into other people's lives, it cannot bear the acts of loving kindness or righteousness that Jesus taught us. The Old Testament principle of tithing is a common thread that runs through all the books of the Bible in the Old Testament, right from Genesis to Malachi. Abraham, the father of our faith, sets an example showing us that the first fruit portion to God was 10% or a tithe. 1 Corinthians 3.13, Paul warns us, there is a judgment day when each one's works will be tested by fire. And if the work survives the fire, he'll receive a reward. But if anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. Laodicea is the only church that Jesus literally tells us how to repent. He says in Revelations 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich with white garments so that you might clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness might not be seen. You know, that word buy is the Greek word agorazo, which also means redeem. Paul used this word in 1 Corinthians 6.20 and 7.23 in describing how Christ bought us or redeemed us through his own blood at Calvary. Revelation 5.9 also uses the word when it says Christ was slain and has redeemed us to God by his blood. However, in this verse, Jesus is literally saying to the Laodicean believers, redeem yourself from the sin of greed by literally transferring a portion of your personal wealth or money into God's kingdom. This is the only way you as a Laodicean believer will become rich in God. Jesus promised that you will be given a white garment and according to 1 Corinthians 9.10, you will increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, Paul explains the difference in how God sees our money when he states this in 1 Timothy 6.10, that the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 3.3 refers to money that is coveted after as being greedy of filthy lucre. However, when money is used correctly as a medium of exchange to bless others, Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 4.16, you sent me help for my needs once and again, not that I desire a gift, 
but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He was talking about a heavenly account. Philippians 2.18 says, Paul said, I've received the things which were sent of you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing unto God. You know, Paul calls money greedily gained as filthy lucre, but if the money's used to minister to others in God's eyes, it becomes an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. When we come back, I want to share a personal experience how God spoke to my heart 33 years ago and warned me that I was part of the Laodicean church and needed to make some drastic changes in my life. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, for he raises up kingdoms and he deposes kingdoms. But what about America? The most prolific nation in the history of mankind, the most productive nation to ever exist, the most powerful military that has ever been created with the most advanced technology known to man. Circling the globe, monitoring the airwaves, dominating the internet, not since man's first breath has any nation achieved such greatness. But is this lady of kingdoms in the Bible? have past generations foretold of her existence. Prophecy USA is proud to present their latest study guide providing over 50 biblical references describing the past, the present, and the future of this great nation. Joining the dots that unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. To order your copy of the Prophecy USA study guide, call 1-888-306-1759 or go to prophecyusa.org. Call today. Welcome back to Prophecy USA. We've been discussing the latter-day believers of Laodicea and how their money directly affected their relationship with God. Several years ago, I received a phone call from my alma mater, Oral Roberts University. I was 32 years old at the time and had been, had been in business for over nine years since my graduation. Now, at that time, the university was heavily involved in a medical missions outreaches to third world nations and they were looking for alumni to volunteer their time and money on the Board of Regents to assist in that initiative. After pondering the request, I realized that I had grown weary of well-doing. I was a believer of Christ, but I was offering very little personal time and financial support to fulfill the commission in spreading the gospel around the world. A tremendous conviction came upon me as I looked at the many blessings that God had given me. At the age of seven, I had prayed the sinner's prayer and received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Yet 25 years later, I had friends who were giving their lives as pastors, missionaries, evangelists. But what was I doing? They were giving their lives to help others, and here I was reaping the rewards of a successful business and not even giving a tithe of my first fruit to God's kingdom. You know, the prophet Malachi explained perfectly where I was in my personal life. In Malachi 3.7, he said, Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you say, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourers for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. You know, Jesus is either Lord of all or not at all. And after much prayer, I decided to take one-tenth of my net worth and I gave it to the Medical Missions Initiative. And once I released those funds, over the next seven days, something supernatural began happening to me that happened to two men in the Bible. According to Acts 10.3, Cornelius was a Roman centurion who one night saw in a vision an angel coming to him, calling out his name. Cornelius was afraid, and the angel said, Fear not, for thy prayers and thine alms are come up 
for a memorial before God. In this passage, Cornelius' actions of giving alms and offerings opened the windows of heaven and God poured out to him revelation knowledge with the angel instructing him to go to Peter who would explain God's plan of salvation. Now previous to this time, Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus responded, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who art in heaven. Now similar to Cornelius, after I released my tithe and offerings to God, I received the prophetic insight or revelation knowledge concerning things to come in North America. And I'll not go into further detail of that event, but the written word that we are teaching at Prophecy USA confirms the spoken word of God I received at that time. And I assure you that flesh and blood did not reveal this unto me. Now before this experience, I had no idea of the eight providential nations we've learned in Scripture, and certainly not the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. And our interpretation of the book of Revelation, to my knowledge, has not been taught quite like this before. However, there's no other nation in history, to my knowledge, that's ever met every description of Babylon the Great before until now. The richest nation in the history of the world houses all seven churches described by Jesus. The sins, the immorality, the Baal worship, the wealthy lifestyle of believers are all abundantly transparent. In fact, over 80% of the believers in America meet the description of the Church of Laodicea who refused to participate financially with first fruits offerings to God's kingdom. If you find yourself falling short of any of the sins found in these churches, it's not too late to make a change. If you follow my lead, dust off your Bible, examine your lifestyle, your morals, your priorities, and then do something about it. The next time you go to the fridge or eat a meal or dine in a restaurant, ask yourself, have I given to the Lord what is His? Have I transferred a portion of my first fruit blessings into God's eternal kingdom? Remember, you can hear directly from God. You don't need anyone to tell you where, when, or who you should give tithes and offerings to His kingdom. God gave you His blessings, and He'll also show you where He wants His first fruits planted. Now, Scripture foretells that there's a tremendous mystery blessing coming to those who dwell in Babylon the Great. While Jesus warns, pray that you might be worthy to escape, but escape what? That will be explained next week as we unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. This is Prophecy USA. My name's Rick Pearson, and I'm reminding you that Jesus Christ is alive, and He's coming back much sooner than many people think. See you next week. Shalom.